Amen. The first of the year. We're glad you're here this morning. Turn with your Bible to the book of Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. And some might consider this a Christmas story, but I assure you it's not. Not even near any time near the Lord Jesus' birth. So let's look together, Matthew chapter 2, starting at verse 1. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have, and, and have come to worship him. Then Herod the king had heard the things. He was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Jesus should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, but out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when thou hast found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till they came and stood uh, over where the young child was. Then they, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come unto the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto uh, him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed unto their own country another way. Let's go to the Lord and pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, I pray that this morning your spirit will be our teacher. Father, that you'd help me to get out of the way that you might share your message with your people. But Father, we just won't hear your word. Lord, help us to be a doer of it and not just a hearer only. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for your precious Son, Jesus Christ, in whose holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Starting off the year right, it's always right to be in the house of the Lord. I think there's no better way to start your year, at least uh, to start it in a, the right attitude and relationship with God. A question for today, and maybe even every day, is what is a wise man? Not a wise guy but a wise man. Uh, there are wise guys out there. That's not what you want to be. Uh, that's a whole other definition that I'm not going to get into. But being a wise man or a wise woman uh, takes primarily knowledge of God and a relationship with Him. Now notice verse 1. It says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod the king, Again, that, that, you might get the impression in that passage that it's saying this is when Jesus was just born. That is not at all what's being said. It's saying around the time of Jesus' birth. Okay, do you all understand that? Around the time, the king of the Israel was Herod. Okay, that's what's being introduced there in verse 2, okay, uh, in chapter 2. And so as we look at that, we need to keep in mind this is around the time. And behold, there were wise men from the east. Uh, uh, um, there were wise men that came. From the east to Jerusalem, verse 2, saying, Where is he that's born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come and worshipped him. I'll be honest with you. Theologically, this is one of those amazing passages. You go, how do these guys from the east know anything about Jesus? How do these guys know anything about him? How do they know who he is, where he came from, what he's about? I mean, uh, there's, this, is not, this is not Israel. These are not Israelis. These are not descendants of, of Israel. These are folks that are completely 
Uh, and really the east we're talking about in the area around Babylon. The area which is over the Fertile Crescent because there ain't nobody living in the desert. And the, and the way if you, you say someone's coming from the east and if you live in Jerusalem, if you're looking, I want you to kind of get this picture in your mind. Imagine you have Israel and Judah and then you have a long desert area where there's nobody living. But you have what they call the Fertile Crescent, and it goes north up through Samaria and all the way up to up near the, the old Assyrian Empire and comes down to modern Iraq and Iran. Okay? That's the Fertile Crescent, and that's the only way you can really even travel today. If you were traveling by car, you still wouldn't travel through the desert uh, unless you want, you know, some people like to travel through the desert, just not me. Uh, if you, none of y'all must have lived in a desert because if you've lived in one, there are certain places you just don't want to go. And this wasn't a way you would travel, especially with animals that needed water because they wouldn't make it. And so there is no traveling. So they're traveling from the east. So they've gone up and they've traveled down. Now, the background we need to understand is first, who is this Herod? This is Herod the Great. We've talked about him before. He's the starter of the Herodian dynasty. He ruled from 37 B.C. to 4 A.D. Excuse me, 37 uh, B.C. To, to 4 B.C. And he was not a Jew. He was an Edomite, uh, a son of Esau. Herod was coming, and he, he was a cunning, ruthless leader. He was famous for grand building projects. Many are still, many, many, you can still see some of the ruins of Herod's creations today. Um, he was most famous for a project, his project, which is Jerusalem's temple. Um, and it wasn't completed until after his death. Next question is, not just who Herod is, but the next question is, who is, who are, who are these wise men? Um, they are not kings. You know the song, We Three Kings, they are not kings. Um... They're magi, they're, mag they're magicians, astrologers, possibly Zoroastrians, uh, wise men from the area of Persia. Their knowledge of the Hebrew scriptures could only be traced back to one source uh, possible, and that would be the time in which Daniel was over all of the astrologers and soothsayers in the time of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, if you wanted to reference that, you'd find that in Daniel chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. And so... How many were there? I know you already have in your mind three. If you can find three anywhere in this text, I'll believe you. But you're not going to because it doesn't tell us that. So we have a group of wise men. We don't know how many there are. The only thing we do know is that they have three gifts. Okay? That doesn't qualify three wise men. Okay, that just qualifies three gifts. Okay, have you ever noticed sometimes we overthink or we try to extend things past what they're really saying? And if we try to say there are three wise men, we're really saying, well, Pastor Joe, everyone's going to bring a gift, right? Uh, we don't know if this is a compilation gift. Maybe everyone brought all the myrrh that they had. Maybe someone else brought all the frankincense, and it's a big, it's a big, because honestly, it supports uh, Mary and Joseph in the land of Egypt for a great deal of time. So it is God's provision that these wise men are bringing for the Lord Jesus as he's in the land of Egypt. Some have said the group could number from two to several hundred or more. How old was Jesus when they came? Well, we're going to look at that in a minute. But notice all Israel was upset, not just carried, but all Israel with him was upset because the wise men came. Now, I'll be honest with you. If you're in, if you're in Washington, D.C., and the, and the powers that be are there, and two people come up and say, hey, uh, we heard about, we saw a star, and we came come, and they'd think two people that have gone cuckoo clock, right? They'd send them to, they'd put them in a nice straight jacket and a Thorazine drip and put them away, wouldn't they? But if several hundred come, Right? And Babylon is a religious place. If they all come, then what does that tell people? Uh-oh, something is happening. So I would recommend to you that there's probably more than three. Okay? Because the whole town of Jerusalem is in uproar. Now let's look at that. 
It says, looking down to verse 2, it says, <clears throat> it says, And Herod, verse 3, And Herod heard the things, and were troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Now, two people don't get the king all tore up. Right? But a good group of folks come, and they all have the same message. And they're all coming from the same region. And they've come to worship a king that threatens this king. Right? Have y'all ever got a new job? How many of y'all ever got a new job? Okay. If you got an old one from the beginning, praise the Lord for you. But when you first get a job, a lot of sometimes, and I've noticed this happens, when you first come in, people around you start to feel a little threatened. Do you see what I'm talking about? They feel a little uncomfortable. They're like, I hope he isn't going to take my job, or hope I'm not going to lose mine to them, or hope he doesn't do a better job than me, or, right? Isn't that right? People are threatened by that. And you could try to be a friend, and you could just say, I'm going to do my job. I don't have any interest in taking your job. But some people just, and, and, and you see all this backbiting and turmoil and all these things that happen in, in a job situation because people want to take care of their turf. Anybody ever here ever been on a turf war? How many of y'all know it's a turf war? Right? This is my territory. This is I'm in charge of this. Don't, don't, be, don't be horning in on me. Woo! Right? Y'all ever met people like that? Do y'all ever think that happens at church? Think that ever happens? Then you are a member here. And so they get, they get nervous. Herod got nervous. He got, he got all up in arms and then all Jerusalem with him. Because they found out that this new baby, he's a threat. And if you read a little bit past what we're talking about this morning, you'll find out how much of a threat he thought it was. Right? He went in there and wiped all the children out of Bethlehem. Slaughtered all of them. So that's a pretty big threat, wouldn't you say? It's probably about two years after the birth of Jesus is when the young child is being referred to. A tiny, not a tiny baby, a young child. Herod later attempted to destroy this unknown child, and he had all children of the age surrounding the area of the ages of two years and younger, and he slaughtered them all. So where does he get that information from? Well, he diligently inquired of the wise men, we're going to see in a moment. He diligently inquired of them of when the star appeared. Okay, do y'all understand that? Y'all following the math here? They saw the star. They started coming. Right? And maybe they didn't immediately, maybe they didn't immediately go. Maybe they had to convince themselves. How many of y'all are, are people that are immediately obedient or sometimes you have to be convinced over time? Y'all are Baptists. So I assure you, it's convinced over time. Nobody here is quick to learn or do anything. I could say the same thing a thousand times, and you'll be like, the, the, the hundred and the one thousand one time I've said it, you'll say, wow, I've never heard that before, Pastor. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the way it is. That's the Baptist way, just the way it is. And uh, I'm not trying to rip on anybody else. That's the way Baptists do. Um, I remember one time I preached on something like for 15, like 15 times. This pastor goes, this young man, this gentleman, he used to sit right here where Stephanie's sitting. And he'd sit. He said, Brother Joe, God, he was excited after service. This came up to me, he gave me a big hug. He said, Brother Joe, I've never heard anything preached like that before. <laughs> we do it. We have them on tape, brother. Would you like to listen? I said the same thing 15 times. This is the 16th time I've been counting it, and you just got it. I mean, maybe you just woke up from your nap. I don't know. But uh, you just got it for the first time. And I love that brother. He's a, he's a fine man of God. But you know what? He's a Baptist. So there's certain things you've got to deal with there. The child, well, notice what it says in verse 3. It says, when Herod the king heard all the things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him, verse 4. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes and people together, it says he demanded of them, now that's, that's kind of Herod for you, he's a king, he doesn't ask nicely. He demanded um, 
of them where Christ should be born. Now, notice this. He knows that it's the Christ immediately. Isn't that interesting? Herod, this Edomite king, he knew immediately who the threat was. He had identification of the Christ, the coming Messiah. All Jews everywhere knew there was a Messiah coming. And the Jews that are still around today, the ones that are Orthodox, that have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, uh, the difference between regular Jews and, and Jews that have accepted Christ, we call them Messianic Jews. Those are Jews that recognize their Messiah. Uh, but most Jews don't. And they're staying in ignorance. And if you ask them, they're still waiting today for their Messiah. And there's some crazy Jewish sects that don't believe that Jesus is going to be born of a woman. So they actually carry between their legs this little catching thing that all of a sudden, one, all of a sudden, all of a sudden somewhere Jesus is going to appear. And they're going to catch him. He's going to have this, this catching drawers that are going to catch him when he comes. I, I really can't get my mind around it, but that's literally what they believe. Um, and so they, they, they wear this really odd-looking dress and outfit. Um, and it's dudes, too, which is really kind of weird. I mean, wow. Whoever that rabbi was, I'm going to need to stick his head underwater for a while just to kind of, in the name of Jesus, uh, just to get him straightened out. I don't know. Uh, but, they, but they believe, they still are, are, are looking for their Messiah when he's already come. And unfortunately, some people will, he will come, but it will be coming the second time on a white horse to rule and to reign. And then it'll be too late, won't it? Notice it says that the, these, these, these scribes and Pharisees, what do they go to? They finally, they haven't been, I mean, I can, they haven't, they weren't in the word. They weren't ready with an answer. Do y'all understand that? It says they had to go search the scriptures. What does that tell you about these scribes and Pharisees? Are these great men of God that are in the word? Are these guys that say, you know what? We, we use the word when it's necessary, when it's usable, when we need it. Right? Notice what it says. It says, look at the passage. Don't, you look for yourself. Verse 5. And they said, in Bethlehem of Judea, in, in, um, um, for thus it is written by the prophets, verse, verse 6, and Bethlehem in the land of Judah are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. First direction of the king and the people, they were they're troubled. Next, they heard that it was Messiah, they, they recognized that it was Messiah, and Messiah's coming troubled them. Do y'all see how that's a problem? Messiah's coming troubles some people. Does it trouble you today? It sure shouldn't, if you know him. But if it does trouble you, oh son, oh daughter, let me tell you, you need to get right with him. Don't be troubled at his coming. Be welcoming his coming. Notice not just troubled. They didn't rejoice and they weren't glad. They didn't have a celebration. They were nervous, troubled, and worried. The Jewish leaders, again, had uh, uh, degenerated to such a level of unwilling to trot down to Jerusalem themselves and see what has happened in Bethlehem. These wise men have come all the way from the east. But do you see a religious leader going with them? No. Oh. Do you see anybody in Jerusalem, anywhere in the religious leaders of all the land, do they, do they go after him? No, they say, oh, no, you, you go ahead. You go ahead. Y'all are real zealous for that. You do it. I'm good where I'm at. Just a few miles from Bethlehem, from, Jer from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, but a group of Gentile magi traveled across the entire Fertile Crescent just to find the Savior. How would you react when you meet him? Notice verse 7, it tells us how they reacted. <clears throat> and Herod, when he, when, he, when, he, when he had privately called um, the wise men, he inquired of them diligently what time the star had appeared. Again, we talked about that a moment ago. Verse 8. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when thou hast found him, bring the, me word again, that I may come and worship him also. Now, does anybody believe that? Verse 6, verse 9, excuse me. 
When they heard all the king um, heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they had which they which they had sawn in the east uh, went bef- before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now understand this about this star: God is bringing these wise men to Jerusalem, which is interesting. That's not where Jesus is. But it's important that uh, God wants someone to know that Jesus has been born in Bethlehem. He wants Herod to know. He wants the religious leaders in Jerusalem to know. He wants all of them to understand that Jesus has been born in Bethlehem. That's the purpose of the star. It's to bring the right people to the right time so they can know the right stuff. Isn't that interesting how God orchestrated all that? just so the folks in Jerusalem could understand, because they, surely God could have taken them directly to Bethlehem. Because notice what Scripture says, it says the star moved. And they rejoiced to see it move. Move to where? To the place, the city in which they were going to go, which is to Bethlehem. Y'all see that? Some of y'all are riding with me, some of y'all already took your nap. That's okay. And so we see that, that they, it moved, and so therefore they, they, were, they, were, they celebrated to see it. Notice what it says in the scriptures. It says, verse 10, And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. They rejoiced to see that. Rejoiced to see that this is where God's going to be working. This is where God's going to be moving. And when they were come unto the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him, And when they had opened their treasures, they presented uh, unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Herod sent the wise men to go search for the child diligently and to send him word back. But he wanted to kill him because he he was a threat. The wise men, men departed, they rejoiced, and they came to the, where the child was, and immediately they bowed themselves down in worship and in praise to God. The wise men saw Jesus, um, and, they, were, and they, they fell down and worshipped. They fell down and worshipped a child. Amen. This isn't, this isn't a great king and majesty and splendor and crowns and gold and fine raiment. This is a small little carpenter child. Is that right? They fell down and they worshipped. Because they were looking for the one that God sent. And see, the one God sent doesn't always look the way we think it should. See, if we thought a king was coming in Jerusalem and we were an Israeli, guess where we would think the king would come from? He'd come from Jerusalem because that's the capital. That's where big deal people come from. No, he came from that little town of Bethlehem. Little shepherd's village. That's where he came from. Very humble beginnings. Lord, help us not to see the way the world sees. Help us not to look the way the world looks. Help us not to behave the way the world behaves. Notice the gifts that were presented. The first gift is gold. Gold represents the Lord's deity, that Jesus is God. When we talk about the New Jerusalem, we talk about streets of gold. We talk about the future, we say gold and precious precious metals and precious uh, gems and diamonds and things that will be a part of that which God has created for us. Now, it will be a cheap enough implement there that you can just walk on it. It won't be that valuable. But it was, in, in, in our culture today, that is a very valuable metal. So one, gold representing deity. Second is frankincense. Frankincense, which spoke of his humanity. This focus of, of frankincense was often used as a burial ointment or a burial scent that you could cover over the smell of death. Very potent, more of a yellowish color. Um, And it would would be used in in burial rites and things like that. Because Jesus was a child that was born to die. He came to die. To live 33 years and to give his precious blood for you and for me. 
came to die. Now, not just frankincense, but the last thing is myrrh. And, and myrrh is of a very blood red color. And this spoke of his suffering. A very expensive uh, uh, spice and, or, or, or fragrance as well. And it was representing his sufferings. His blood being spilt, his body being bruised and broken for our sin. And so in the gifts, we see the Savior coming to save us from our sin. And the very things that were brought represented to us even today of what Jesus came to do. Look at verse 12. It wasn't sufficient that they just uh, were going to... Um, give their gifts, but notice that they never, that God said, you know what, don't go back. Verse 12. And being warned of God in a dream, that they should not return to Herod. They departed to their own country another way. Herod, this Edomite, he wanted to kill Jesus. And he pictures an old struggle between Jacob and Esau. We find that in Genesis chapter 25, the spiritual versus the carnal. There's a battle that you're going to face throughout this coming year. And the battle's going to be, am I going to be carnally minded and be no good to God? Or am I going to be spirit, spiritually minded, being led by the Spirit of God? It's funny, when you think about Herod, you think about an old wicked king. Everything that represents our fleshly, carnal, me first, I want it my own way, it better look like I want it to look, attitude and behavior. And your spiritual behavior and your being led by the Spirit of God should be not my will, Lord, but yours be done. Not my way, but your way. Not the way I like it, but the way you like it. Amen. See, that's what's so funny about today. Among Baptists today, people are always telling me, Pastor, this is the way I want it. This is the way I like it. I'm going to have it my way. And I say, okay, you can have it your way. But don't expect it to be God's way. You can always have it your own way. But it won't be God's way. You can have anything you want. You, it, it's, it, you can do it your own way. But don't think God is like a little, 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 your little buddy you get to put in your pocket. And he's just going to come along for the ride the way you want to ride it. And the direction you want to go. Now, friends, see, we've got to submit to him. That means that he's in charge and he runs it all. Amen. Or you're running it all. But you have to decide that. See, he won't make you follow him, but he won't go with you. Amen? He won't go with you. And so, so many today say, they say, Pastor, I want to do it my way. Pastor, I want to do this. This is what suits me. I like it this way. And I'll say, well, friend, I don't, I, you know what, I, I, I have a way I like it too, but it doesn't matter either. What matters is what does God like? What honors Him? What glorifies Him? What pleases Him? Because that's what we're created for. To please Him, to honor Him. We are created for Him, and we sustain by Him. I have six things this morning, so don't get stirred up. I have a little bit of time, so I'm going to share them with you. Number one, do you welcome Christ's second coming? Do you welcome him? Come, Lord Jesus, come. Two, how do you come to worship? Are you celebrating? Are you rejoicing with thanksgiving and an attitude of giving to God and love? See, the, the wise men had an attitude of worship. When they came, they came and they bowed themselves down first. See, when you come in here, you should have your heart bowed down to God. And your spirit towards Him. And then, the next thing is then you give to Him your praise. You give to Him financially. You give to Him because He's given so much to you. See, that's the right attitude for, for church. That's what church is supposed to be. 
Unfortunately, it doesn't really work that way sometimes. People come in, they have a disgruntled attitude. I can't believe I've got to come here. Uh, that preacher's going to be loud, or that preacher's going to be this or that. And you already got a stinking attitude. And you'll get nothing from God when that happens, by the way. You'll get nothing from him. Zero zilch nada. People say, I'm not getting nothing from the message. I said, well, you, did you count amens? Did you, did, you, uh, did, you, did you listen to how many times my voice got raised and wrote a little, wrote a little note to yourself? Or, I mean, that, to that, that is, that is the most carnal, fleshly, pagan behavior a person could have. But people do it. They want to pick apart things and make them. And I, I want to say, friends, do you understand who is in control here? Do you understand who's on the throne? Do you understand who died for your sin? How can your fleshly carnal ways get in the way of worship? Amen? Because that's the only thing that gets in the way. That's the only thing that gets in the way. And the third thing, that babe in the manger that we just, we just celebrated last month, he didn't come to be in a manger. He wasn't a manger. But he came... To live 33 years on this flesh and to give us new truth that we have never, the, the, the riches that we've received because of what Jesus Christ came and told us. That's all that red stuff in your Bible, amen? And, and all the wonderful things he's given you, all the truth you've received over and above the generations that preceded you. And you should be thankful to him for your, the word of God you have. So you know what's funny is? Most of us have no idea how wonderful it is to have the Word of God in our hand. You know, for 400 years we've had it in our hand. But you know what? Before then, nobody had it. No one had it. And they were locked out from the Word. Friends, do you want to go back to that day? You want to think how precious it is that we got the word of God in our hand where we can study it and grow and become the Christian God wants us to be? He's given us so much and yet we never appreciate that which we have. <coughs> now I had three more things. And these are what I want you to see this week. Number one, God is looking for those like the wise men who are receptive and responsive to him. See, he's sent a star, and they came. I don't know what he's going to do in your life. He's going to do something. He's going to show you something. He's going to speak to you in some way. And the question is, are you going to respond to that, or are you just going to sit there and stand still? Amen? <clears throat> we don't have a good example of anyone that God used that heard God speak and said, I'm not going. Amen? Amen? We have examples of people that heard God speak and responded in faith. You want to check that out? Look at Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> Two. Are you troubled or are you joyful when the topic of Jesus comes up? You're at work and someone says, Jesus. <clears throat> now that could be a curse and you say, well, are you praying? Amen. You could always ask him that. Are you praying? And he'd say, no, I'm not praying. I said, well, don't, don't mention him unless you're going to pray. Because other, the other part's blasphemy, right? Using the Lord's name in vain. But then also, not just that, but when, when you're in, in a family environment or when you're at a Thanksgiving feast or you're at a, a party or anything like that, and when someone says the name of Jesus in a context that this person believes in Jesus, do you slink away or do you stand up strong and say, that's my Savior, that's my Lord, that's who I serve and love? I can't answer that for you, but I think the answers are pretty clear that we should have. The final thing is, in the gifts that were given, we see Jesus' the reality that he was coming to pay our debt. You know, when I think of the Lord Jesus, I always want to remember that he paid my debt. I want to remember that he paid your debt. You know, he, he's done so much for us, and guess what? We've done very little to nothing for him. You know, it's interesting to me, a lot of times today and a lot of times in our culture, people want an attaboy. Uh, pat on the back. 
And some people long for it. And I always say this. That's fine. But if you get an attaboy or a pat on the back, you've received your reward. Right? You've received it. But if you do things because, and you, Jesus said, do it in, do in your, you don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing when you're doing your giving. Because you don't want to get the praise of men. Because that will be your reward. You want the praise of God. Not just with your giving, but your actions, your behavior, your words, your deeds, everything. It should be done unto God, not unto man. And if we look at the next year, as this coming year we look at 2018, I hope that your, this year will be a year you did unto the Lord, not unto yourself and not unto others. We're supposed to do unto others as we would have them do unto us, right? Right? Not what they say. But I'd say one better than that. We should do unto them as God would have us to do unto them. And how would, have God, how would God have you treat others? He's real specific, amen? The Ten Commandments, real quick, just a little note. Should you lie to your neighbor? Nope. Should you lie to anybody? Nope. Should you steal from anybody? Even a little thing? Nope. Should you, should you covet that which isn't yours? Nope. Friends, we've got a long list. Did you realize that? And let me, let, me, let me fill you in real quick. Jesus Christ verified all those commandments except for one, which was keep the Sabbath day holy. Because he kind of told them they messed that up. They made that of no effect because they added way too much to what the Sabbath day was supposed to be. So he was constantly rebuking them for that. But every one of the other commandments, amen, he said, I, want you, I don't want you just to those standards, I want you to a higher standard. If you look upon a woman, you will have lust in your heart. If you, can see, if you have hatred towards anybody. Amen? You're guilty, Scripture says. Friends, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be guilty of that. I want to be clean before God. I want to be right with Him. I want to walk with Him. If you want to do that this morning, and you want to start out the right, start out this year right, then you should, I shouldn't have to ask you. You should come run to this altar, and it should be full up with people that want to be right with God. But if you're happy the way you are, and you think everything's good the way it is, and you stay comfortable in your seat, and don't bother moving. But those that are ready to get right with God and get ready with God and be excited for what God has in store for them in 2018, don't wait, don't hesitate. Follow the Spirit's leadership this morning. Let's go, Lord, and pray together. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for just an opportunity to study your word and to grow in our faith. We thank you for the example of the wise men. Father, I pray that we could be wise like those wise men and that we will come to you, that we would seek you, that we would walk in a way that pleases you. Father, I pray you just encourage each one this morning. Father, we just thank you for loving us. We thank you for your precious son, Jesus Christ, in whose holy name we pray. Amen.